All right, good evening. I'm going to call this facilities board workshop to order. I will hand it over to Dr. Schultz. Good evening, board and community. Thank you. This is um, the first in what will be a series of informational meetings around our facilities projects. Some of this information you have seen before over the years. What we're going to do tonight is sort of lay a foundation of everyone's understanding of the facilities, how facilities are funded, where we are with our projects and our current bonds, and then also look at the proposed housing in the city of Pittsburgh and the impact on our school district. We will have another facilities workshop on April 29th. And so as you're listening to all the information that's coming before you this evening, also, please let us know other information that you're going to want to see when we come back to you in the end of April. And then in June, we'll be asking the board during the two board meetings in June to dis discuss and decide whether or not we will have a bond on the November 2024 election. As you'll see this evening, the last time that we had a bond was in 2018, and our current project of Hillview Junior High School we'll then use all of our remaining bonding um, funds that we have. Hmm. So that combined with any potential increase in enrollment is what we'll be looking at. So we're chunking out the information, laying some foundational work this evening, um, updating the numbers that you have seen before with the latest that we have from the city. And then again, we'll be coming back to you in April. So you know, along with asking any clarifying questions throughout this evening, please also keep track of information that you would like to see when we come back in the end of April. And I will turn it over to Mr. Haria and Mr. Scott. Thank you. And for anyone who's watching virtually, we do have these presentations posted. So you should be able to click and see the same documents that we're looking at here. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Scott. Since... Good afternoon, superintendent, board members and community and those in the audience. We are, since the superintendent did a great job getting this kicked off with uh, the presentation, the table of context, what we plan to be working on, I'm gonna jump right to the planning and the process of funding for the district, which is page four. Thank you. So it's very important to understand how we get funded. Uh, it's important to know that local bond measures are important for a district. State match is also important for the district. It takes the two of those for us to get funding. Mr. Uh, Scott, I'm sorry. I'm getting a little bit of um, um, feedback from the out there that we need you to speak right into your mic. Okay. Like I'm doing here. Otherwise, it doesn't pick up for the um, folks at home. Thank you. Thank you. So like I said, the... It's important for us to make sure that we apply for every single grant that, that's out there. Also, we have to make sure that we pass our local bonds because the local bonds are the match, to match our funds so that we can get dollars back on our projects. Uh, the uh, If it's modernization, it's 60-40%. If it's new construction, it's 50-50. But 50-50 doesn't mean dollar for dollar is based on what the list they have for the construction. We don't get paid for hallways. We don't get paid uh, money for furniture. So those dollars come off of our bond funds for those items if we was elected to do those those type of things in a project. So give me a little example of what gets paid for out of the dollars. Uh, Hillview is, in our eyes, is a new school. State eyes is a modernization. So the five extra classrooms that we're adding there, those are considered new classrooms. The rest of it is under the 6040 formula for getting funds because it's not a new school to the state. <clears throat> Mr. Scott? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming during, during this workshop, we can just interrupt yes. and, and ask questions. So seems here that what you mean by matching funds is um, as long as we 
use local bonds, then we're able to then get matching funds from the state based on the formulas that you just described. That is correct, providing that the state has money. Got it. So it's, it's, it's like this year, the uh, cash organization, which is the coalition for housing for students, uh, in our organization, we're pushing the governor to put on the ballot a bond measure for uh, a new ballot for funding for schools. Right now, the state is running out of money for bond programs, but so we need both part of those items to make a complete project. Got it. Thank you. Question. Question. <clears throat> Well, yes, Mr. Miller. The difference between a modernization and a new school is that even though we're building Hillview and it is a new school, we're only going to get funding for modernization. Yes, only only the five new classrooms considered new because we already have an existing facility under that under that name. If it was building a brand spanking new school, then it'll be under the 50 50. An additional brand new that's considered an existing school you already have. Oh, you mean like if we were to buy, put a school out on Harbor Street, build it from the ground up, that would be new. That is correct. And they would fund us for that. That's right, at 50%. But because Hillview's been there, it's called modernization. That is correct. And because we're adding five additional classrooms for future growth, then we get that portion of the dollars for those five classrooms is under the new construction, 50-50. Thank you. So talking about money and how we fund our school facilities, uh, we doing some pre-planning right now for the bond measure perhaps in 2024 in the in the November elections. So what the slide shows is an update as to where we are currently and what the steps are in terms of planning, you know, if we were to consider a bond measure for November 2024. So we've compiled a survey and that survey should be going out after the election. So March 10th is what we're targeting. Uh, the survey will be done in various different modes, right? So we're looking at doing phone, text, and internet surveys. And so those are the mechanisms we're utilizing. Once we render that survey, we'll get some feedback or the survey results, and we'll bring that forward to our facilities workshop on April 29th. Uh, then as the superintendent mentioned before, in June, we'll lay forth before the board information and action should the board want to consider putting that on the election ballot uh, for November. And then if the board so chooses, then August 10th, we'll uh, make sure that's the deadline in order to have the measure put on the ballot. And then, of course, we would then spend August and November preparing for that bond measure. And November would be the actual bond election. So that's the phase of our pre-planning right now. Mr. Haria? Yes. Um, do you plan on giving us the survey methodology when you present the survey to us? For example, the questions that are being asked, things of that nature? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, you know, I'd like to just start by saying thank you to this community in Pittsburgh. Over the past 20 plus years, we've got $440 million. And that's com the community saying, you know, we truly value great educational facilities. And they've invested in, 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 in you know, in, in, in Pittsburgh. So we've put that money to good use, built great schools, which is really want to truly thank the community. You know, since 1995 to date, $440 million is quite a bit of money. When you consider our free and reduced and our unduplicated pupil count, you know, in the city of Pittsburgh and in the Pittsburgh School District, uh, it's pretty phenomenal in terms of investment. And so in the latter part of this uh, presentation today, we'll not only be talking about what investments we've been making and want to continue making in terms of school construction, but we'll also be talking about the total cost of ownership. It looks at what, uh, what other things do we need to have in place in order to operate, maintain, sustain that huge investment that's been made in our facilities. So with that in mind, I'll pass it back on to Mr. Scott. One of the great things that the superintendent wanted you to see was that what we did on these different bond measures, uh, um, the measure D, we did Willow Cove, Highlands, Hillview, Stoneman, Portables. On E, 
We did Foothill, Marina Vista, Rancho, more Stoneman projects. Jay, Black Diamond, New Construction, The Cab, The Boys Baseball Field, The Football Field, L, Heights, New Construction, MLK, New Construction, Parkside Campus Replacement Project, and the high school 32 classroom construction, Winter Cove mechanical construction, and then Hillview, uh, we did some design work for some a AC work on the campus. Now, Mr. Scott, when you say the cab, you mean the Creative Arts Building, correct? That's correct. Sorry about saying that. Mm -hmm. And all those projects are complete. Not clicking, not moving. I think I need a battery. Hmm. <laughs> I was flagging. <laughs> so just some examples of the what those sites look like. Um, so like I said, I am proud to be part of this community that did some work here on this community and there'll be some nice schools when that were attracted me to this district. When I was interviewing and I drove around and looked at the different sites that were, had been completed at the time, I like seeing where a district and the community is actually putting dollars where their mouth is because that's important for education purposes and that's in my personal eyes. So. And then we had Parkside and uh, P. Uh, completion of the Parkside High, the uh, Highlands Window Replacement, Highlands Mechanical Systems, Widow Cold Fire Lane, the uh, Stadium Lights, the Tennis Courts, the most recent Los Madonna's Portable Replacement Project. Uh, we paid the facilities map to playing out of P, and then we just wrapped up the girls softball field. Superintendent, did we get a special letter? A letter? Yes. <laughs> We were um, cleared from our Office of Civil Rights complaint. Um, yesterday, we received the notification that we were cleared. We had received a complaint. What Mr. Scott's referring to is because we had, after we built the boys' baseball stadium, there was a complaint that we didn't have an equal facility yet for the girls. So that project then had to get moved up, and we finished that project, and we got our official notification yesterday that that has been closed and with um, gratitude to us and the team. <clears throat> and then what's under construction right now, as you know, Hillview, once you get past the lakes and the rain that's out there. <laughs> I did hear some pictures of those sites. Again, with some great pictures that uh, show what good workmanship has been going on, uh, trying to show that we have spent the tax dollar to the max. Uh, we try to squeeze every dollar, as I try to squeeze every dollar I can to make sure we get the maximum uh, results on our projects. Now, Mr. Scott, you said that the Hillview construction is underway. What's the anticipated completion for that? It's in 26th uh, school year. Thank you. Uh, we are, once it dries out, I guess real quick on that project, The uh, we're getting ready to put down some line treatment to help dry out the area. And then uh, we've already cut half of the bush a drop off already up front. Uh, once that dries, then we're going to finish up the second half of the driveway. And then we're going to start working on the pads. We've already did the abatement of the area, which is moving the asphalt. I believe now asphalt has stuff in it. You got to make sure it's taken out properly and taken to the right place. So that part has been done and completed. So once that's, uh, it dries out, we will start uh, forming and digging for the foundations of the main building. Now, we have some other smaller projects that we're working on uh, that came up as needs to the district. Uh, we have some clocks and bells that uh, created some problems for us that we need to take care of. Uh, that's Los Madonna's, Stoneman, and the uh, high school. Uh, we also had uh, some problems at the fire alarm system at Stoneman need to be taken care of. And then there was a hood issue over at Marina Vista that we need to take care of. We had equipment outside of the hood space and the fire marshal came by 
and cider. So we got to make sure we take care of those type of items. So these are some additional dollars that we had to spend that we're using from funds that has come in from the reimbursables that we had turned in for the state to pay for these fundings. This is a list of the current projects that back in March 13, 23, that the board had approved. I was wanna bring you back to where we stand. First of all, there is no money for any of these projects. The next list of projects is the Highlands Elementary Portable Replacement Project, the Willow Cole Portable Replacement Project, the Stoneman Portable Replacement Project, and then the Athletic Condition Center uh, Project. Uh, those are the projects that are that you approve for the last two rounds of a project, and this is the pecking order that you've given us to work on. Now, Mr. Scott? When you say portable replacement project, you mean replacing the portables with brick and mortar building, like at LME, correct? That is correct. Thank you. Thank you, President Moreno. That was going to be my question, which is what um, is actually needing to be replaced. So thank you for that. Yes. One of the options that we do bring at the same time is that we bring you, when we get rid of that point, we bring it to you and give you the option. Do you want to replace the portables? already went in place the whole campus and we give you numbers and then the board decides which route they want. That's what happened at uh, Parkside. That's what happened at Hillview. And so you made that decision to replace both campuses at that time. <clears throat> so when we get closer around to those things and money is available, then uh, we'll bring forth those same projects to you to look at. Um, Mr. Scott. Yes. Um, the portables that we're replacing, what's the life, the portables that we're not replacing, what would be the life span on those portables and how many schools do we have with portables? And what would be the three, I guess, question, what would be the difference between the portables and the brick and mortar school? Well, the first question was the life of the portables. Most of the portables are 20, 25 years old. The How the state funding work, I'm going to show you a slide in, in a minute, that after 20, year, 20 years, you're eligible for funding to help offset that cost. So the life is for portables is 20 years, or some portables sit for 30, 40, 50 years, and which is a sad thing. I've been in districts where we have holes in the floor and stuff where you, you actually see the ground, the kids walked in there. So they last as long as... They can last as long as you can fix them, but they do wear out and the codes do change. So they don't meet the new codes that we have to build our new schools to. The other question was uh, the replacement versus brick and mortar. Uh, it's better because now you have a solid foundation. You have something built not on just wood cripples. You actually have a solid roof. All the new codes are applied in the building. So it's a better cost and a better facility for the kids to be in. And the difference between replacing the portables with a stand with the building and replacing a whole school. So, for example, the estimate of what it was to build Parkside Elementary School, since these are elementary portables. The cost for Parkside was right at forty million dollars. So versus so, a twelve million dollar project. But we didn't put portables on there. Is that the distinction you're making? No, just the difference when you replace a whole school, an elementary school, a rough estimate is $40 million. And then portables, depending on how many, are, you know, roughly around $12 million when you're replacing. It's like it's like adding on a new wing of the school, like at Los Modanos. Like and are we, are we working for um, brick and mortar buildings for our school, or do we have quite a bit of Schools that still have portables. These are the last, this list is pretty much the last list of class. Other than uh, Foothill, which is on the list, is the last list of projects to have portables. And we still have portables at Pittsburgh High School because of the enrollment there. So we do still have portables, some classrooms and portables at Pittsburgh High School at this time. That's correct. So I do want to bring to note that these but prices. One more thing. If we, since we don't have any more room for portables, 
at Pittsburgh High School, that means that we're gonna have to look at different options for those cl for those classes if it continues to grow there? Correct. And I just wanna remind you that these numbers are based on 2021. Escalation costs have increased. So that 12 million could be easy as 15 to 16 million. I just wanna let you know. I wanna give you a reference where those numbers were taken from at that time. Yes. Um, so Mr. Scott, um, so the portables that we have, are those that we're leasing or are those that we own? So uh, most of our leases been have to, been exhausted already and taken away. Restaurants are pretty much out. We own them. So like in terms of like um, just curiosity, like once we do these, is it just like we're now going to rotate them to wherever – like we wherever like the need exists, or are we just gonna have like a storage place for these? What we have been doing is the the ones that are in better shape, and that we can use for parts. We take them over to the old Riverside site. The rest of those that's in bad shape, we tear down and get them off site, or we offer it to a school district that may need something they don't have as good as may need it. So we try to sell them. Okay. If not, if we can't sell them, and then we we tear them down. Okay. But we do offer to other districts that they want to pick them up at their cost. Okay. One thing I want to emphasize is because we get asked this a lot is that we don't ever put the district office on a bond project. We we keep all of the bond funding 100% for schools. And so that's named there because there's an obvious need. You may have been in here. Sometimes the rain's coming through. There are things that we have to do to keep the building safe, but we do not include the district administrative building, this building, in any bond projects. Yeah, and that's why it says other funding options. And then there's, there's a project what, that... What would be some other funding options? Well... When, when we come back on the 29th, we will have options from our consultant that has given us things to look at to determine some of those options may be. Oh, so we can look at those options because the to do those things for the district. For example, and this is not anything that we have even explored, for example, a developer may have interest in this particular piece of land. We may say we will um, sell this to you but you need to build us a district office at another location that we have some some room or some land, things like that. That would be the, the type of funding that we would have to look at in order to do anything significant for a district office. Okay. Only then, as an example. <laughs> I understand. I couldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> the uh the other thing is there's an another project that we need to add to our list to our list of projects is that we never did do a track and field at MLK. The other uh, middle schools have a track and field, and that one doesn't have one. So when it come down to adding stuff or approving the list, we need to make sure that we at least look at MLK for a track and field. So keep that in your minds. And I presume that there's space for a track and field at LMLK? Yes, I, I figured when I walked in and looked at what we could do there, there is space. Okay. So early on, you heard me mention the $440 million investment mm -hmm. that this community has made in building new buildings, modernizing new buildings. But in order to, to keep that, you know, investment safe, we need to be able to operate, maintain, sustain, and replace when necessary some of the components of the facilities. So what you have in front of you here is a list of uh, projects or things that need needs for the school district going down into the future saying, you know, there are various components that either need replacement, um, there's a timeline to be able to do those things, uh, they say the invisible creates the visible, right? You don't necessarily see the seedlings or the roots taking form, but when it sprouts, then then you see that there's an issue. So that way, 
we need to make sure that we are anticipating the future needs of the district and making sure that there's a funding mechanism in place so when those needs come up, we have the dollars to be able to address them. And so there, there are two lists. They're side by side. It's the exact same list. One list, the first one on the right-hand side is, sorry, on the left-hand side is in alphabetical order. And the list on the right-hand side is in descending order uh, in terms of, of, of dollar value. So these are just some of the needs of the school district that we have to address. So for example, our turf fields, um, some of them are in need of replacement and some of them are pretty old. The useful life of a turf field is 10 years. Of course, where we can get a little bit more out of it, we definitely will. But they cost around approximately $2 million to replace. And so when you take that into consideration, that's a pretty hefty amount of money. And you know, we would, uh, Mr. Miller had, was talking about alternative funding mechanisms. Well, we have the general fund, we have capital. If we our general fund is pretty strained in terms of what we can afford to take out of there, so the other mechanism for that is capital. So that's why we're putting these things together saying, these are the needs of the school district in terms of facilities, so we can continue making sure they're in great shape in order to maintain, operate, and replace when we need to. Of course, then. So that means, so how are we paying these expenses now if we don't have them into our budget? Where is these, when emergency comes up, where are those funds being pulled from? For buildings, roofs, where are we getting those funds from? That's, that's, that's the tough part because, you know, as they come up, depending on the size of those issues, Mr. Scott was mentioning the bells and clocks issue. And if we did not get some refunding back from the state matching funds very recently, we would not have been able to address that right now. It may have been a longer process or the other mechanism is we'd have to pay for it from the general fund, but that means you're going to have to sacrifice something else or stop doing something else in order to put that into your budget because it doesn't exist right now. And as a school district, we don't have a contingency fund even in capital to be able to cover emergencies as they come up. So would this would cover that? So this provides and says, look, we have a need for about $40 million worth of these types of projects and would create the funding to be able to do that. Thank you. So let's move on to another funding mechanism, which is developer fees. Um, we get developer fees for residential buildings and commercial buildings as and when they come up. Uh, right now, our developer fees are $4.08 uh, for residential, per, I think it's per square foot, and commercial, it's uh, 66 cents per square foot. Um, most recently, the state just approved new rates, uh, residential being $5.17 and commercial being 84 cents per square foot. Now, we are currently undergoing a fee justification study. Uh, we will come back to the board in April with that study. And if that study says, hey, you know, we can justify a new rate, then we'll come to the board with that information that will help us uh, increase our developer fees. Um, this is just a small history of our developer fees. We usually bring the report. The report was brought to the board in January, so pretty recently uh, uh, for developer fees. As you can see, we started with the balance of one thousand, sorry, one point seven million dollars. Um, we received about seven hundred twenty-two thousand uh, from developer fees and interest. And then, in terms of our expenses, we put some capital outlay that was basically for our TK buildings as well as moving some portables. And then, you know, we also paid uh, for some taxes the enrollment st study that we do every year. And so, as you can see there, right at the bottom, our fund balance is $2.3 million. As Mr. Scott was mentioning early on, you know, even when you do classroom replacements, Las Madonnas was our latest example. We paid, I think, $18, $18 million for that project. Yes. Our developer fees are $2 million. They won't even cover a few classrooms, permanent classrooms. So, you know, when you think of developer fees and what you can utilize them for and how far they can go, there's not a lot of money in terms of what we may need to provide in terms of creating student capacity if there is limited capacity at a school site. 
it would help somewhat, but it does not cover the cost of you know providing those facilities. We really wanted to show the board and the community the actual funds that we receive for developer fees, because a lot of times people assume, oh, there's building, you get that developer fees, you don't need any more money. But And we're certainly happy to have the developer fees. But as you can see from the reality of what we collect, that is not enough to build a new building, yet alone um, even a wing or portable we can do some portable additions, some things like that, but we cannot build an additional without having to save for years. Mr. Scott, back to you. Well, this is something, this is a slide that you have not probably seen ever. This is. <laughs> that's, uh, that's true. Explain, Mr. Scott. This is how we get funding. Um, this is when the next dates of funding coming available to our district. This is from a long time of effort that we put in to make sure we do get dollars. Uh, our district in the past have not been really good at making sure we follow up to the process. Uh, since I've been here, I've been trying to make sure that we stay on top of getting dollars and looking for the avenue to get the funds. So we have, have received some dollars. We have dollars coming and we have dollars in the future that we lined out. The state gives you a timetable when you apply for dollars. No. I'm gonna go to a better sheet. Mr. Scott, yes. if I can ask a question, just, just for clarity for anyone that's listening. Here it says summary of application for state facility program grants. That's the matching state dollars that you spoke about earlier, correct? That is correct. So what this graph is showing is that for each building that we build, then after they're built, we can apply for these grants, AKA matching funds to reimburse us either on the 60, 40 or 50, 50 formula from the state. Actually it starts before it ends. So okay. how our project starts off is that when we know we have a project, we file for the right to get funding. Okay. They, and then we submit our drawings to CDE because they have to approve classroom size. They got to approve all those different things to make sure it meets the requirements that you are eligible to get dollars. So that first step that we do is we submit to the state. The SDD say, these projects here we're going to be building, we're going to want some dollars. We're trying to claim our spot. We get in line. There's over a thousand districts and everybody's trying to get in line. So when these projects hit, and it takes four or five years to get your dollars from the state, but you got to be in line and you got to stay on top of the changing regulations that happen on the lawn. And our regulations have been changing. You change a rule, you get back in line. You change something else, you got to get back in line. You got to make sure that your timelines are met on, on certain things. So this is our timeline formula of things that we apply for, things that will and will not come in for. Um, there are some that has no room for, for new construction. There's some that has no room for modernization because we have exceeded those numbers and we don't have the capacity built into our program. So those things that we have, um, we have done. So this gives you an example where we are in that process. Uh, we wanted to show what we've done since 18, 2018. First year, round three, when I first got here, uh, three million dollars came in. We was working on, you was closing out Willow Cove project. There was a problem in Willow Cove. We we straightened the problem out, and we were able to get three million from the state. From that time to to last year, we've been working on other projects. The high school project was done back in two thousand seventeen. Uh, Willow Cove, another project that wasn't finished. So all that timeline, we in line trying to get to our funding. So in 23 hit, money came in from projects. Our kindergarten program money we applied for came in. Our uh, Parkside project that we completed. That project was the fastest project I ever done that got money that quick because we completed it to your timeline, money came in. That's just how it's supposed to work because we was actually making sure we was on top of everything. And then I have a chart here that shows what we did with the $9 million, but those are where I have. And then in 24, we got another 2.3 million came in already 
That's what we're using now to help offset some of those clocks and bells and fire alarm systems to take care of that project. And this, this is where we spend it the money on those projects. So we set aside, because I don't want to make sure, I want to make sure that Hillview has enough money. So of that nine million, we set aside six million just to have that cushion to make sure what we do is taken care of. Then we had other projects. The girls' softball field had a shortfall of four hundred some thousand dollars, mm -hmm. almost five hundred thousand. That money covered that. We had lost McDonald's was short two million dollars because of their project. That covered it. Those things. So we used those nine million dollars for all these small little projects to make sure that we didn't go into the general fund. Said general fund, we need, we need, we need. So mm -hmm. the capital yeah. is sustaining its own project and making sure we we run in the positive on the capital side and not touching. The if those fund. funds hadn't come in, the nine million, then we would have had to go back to the general fund and tweak it. That, or not do the project. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. probably more likely. Yeah. And so th that's the most important part of, of the facility side of the fence is that you, you're always constantly on top of your funding and making sure that you're getting those grants and stuff coming back in. If you don't, those are good things to have, the offset that comes in. That's why you want you go through the process of passing your bond. Make sure you go through the process of submitting the paper, the paperwork so you can have those extra dollars coming in. If you don't, you're sitting only with your bond funds only. Now, this you can see a little better. And this is the timeline when new eligibility is coming in in green when funds are available and how much funds we can receive from the state. So you see, if you look across from Heights, Heights is slated. You know, Heights was done a while back. We are now getting money from Heights on that project. It's also eligible for new funding this year too. So we can get in line for no projects on Heights if we had new projects to do there. Can can I ask a question about this graph? Sure. Just to ensure that I'm getting it right. So you have all the different schools. So here it says total state grant at 60%. So the minimum that we can get based on the projects there add up to 8.8 .8 million. Mm -hmm. And the maximum possibility that we can get is 12.7. Is that accurate? That is correct. And how that works is depending on your paperwork and what you put in your drawings, Mm -hmm. Like I said, hallways are not counted. Got it. So I got to take the hallways out of that that, that project. So that's how it goes to max versus. So if you exceed your max, then you see the amount that they have set aside for you, you get the max. If you just barely make it, you get the minimum amount. So let me ask you this. So then the next question is, when do we anticipate the possibility of these funds? I know you have some dates there about date your future el eligibility, but I'm not quite sure if those are dates when we're anticipating the funds or if those dates mean something else on the far right. The majority of that money will be coming in very shortly. All right. Well, but I can't give you a solid date. It's because depending on the paperwork, everything goes to the state, have to have their money too. It it depends very much on if the state has the money. So that the paperwork's sense. extremely important, but the state... And depending on what the state's economy, you know, the state's budget is doing, the state sometimes will delay. And they've done that in the past. Historically, when they've hit bad financial times, they've delayed these payments um, as well. So there is a possibility that could be delayed. Um, some And because they may have a certain pool. So one example with Parkside that happened recently was that all of our paperwork was in but there were other districts that had um, a higher priority for getting their funds based on probably they didn't have their funds reimbursed before or whatever. So they said, well, everything's in, but unfortunately you're not going to make this round of funding because these other districts have a higher priority. Well, then one or two of those other districts didn't get whatever it was they needed to get in. So then a month later we got notice. All right, you, you are now moved up and you will be, the next in line for the reimbursement, which is what then what happened. So that's why it's general, but it, it depends a lot on the state. Thank and, you. Uh, another good example of that is that in that same site, Parkside, we were eligible for 2.8 million, but because they only had 2.3 or 2.23, what it was, they uh, said, would you accept that? And we said, yes, we would accept the 2.3. <laughs>
where, where is the state getting their money to give to us? Bonds. Bond the state passes a bond. So they're going to have a bond? They had one in the past, but they're looking at putting another one on the ballot. That is correct. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Any more questions? Enrollment projections. Uh, this is based on going out to 2023. What we're going to need. Mr. Scott, sorry. It has to go right in the mic or the people oh, at home can't hear. Sorry about that. I, I, was, I was leaning back. I'm interested in this. This slide is telling us that how many students and how shortfall we are based on a new housing coming in uh, into our district. Uh, and this is going out to 2023. Uh, there, These numbers are good numbers because the city has a number that goes out to 2024. 2040 was even greater than this number here. So we're going to have a tremendous amount of growth coming in from the community of all the housing projects that's going to be built around us in our community. Mr. Scott, just to make sure we understand this graph. So what this graph is telling us on the annual basis, this is how much our district is expecting to increase in pupils that per is year. And then the top aggregate number is the total as you add each year. So by 2023, we anticipate adding 2,324 students to the district? As a total, yes. And again, just to be clear, that's the total that's generated by the housing. It does not factor in yet any of our projections where we have some declining enrollment. So there's a net projection that will come later. So this is in the there slide. Are more, so, some more analysis that needs to happen to that. Correct. This is the number based on the housing Got itself. It. Not all those students may come to our district. Correct. Right. Got it. Understood. Or may not be two thousand or may not be two thousand more than we have now because we may have other projections showing that in some grades we're lowering. Got it. So got it. All right. And this is broke. This just breaks it down by grade level in the year. And this is the moderate projection. That is correct. Okay. Uh, just, I always got to say this here for the facility side. When we go to the state, we take the higher number because we're going to get that one shot of asking funds. If we go in low and they say, well, we needed another. 10 classrooms, they're not going to pay for the extra 10 classrooms because you didn't ask for that four or five years down the line. Earlier. And you already built the building with the less classrooms. That is correct. Got you. Makes sense. This is the same number versus the conservative side. The conservative one. Yes. Got it. Which has a lower total number. That is correct. Okay. Same here. Grade by grade. Middle school, high school, elementary school numbers, same thing. Did I miss the slide? I missed one. Okay. Right, so now we're moving on to enrollment projections for the whole. And so this is taking you know, all the trends into account, including the housing, but also yeah. including what may happen from a, 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 a smaller birth rate, uh, people moving out of state, you know, all those. Here we go. So in this chart here, what we're looking at is, is our total enrollment, looking with all the combined trends, the latest demographic birth rates, looking at declining enrollment, looking at new housing being built, all that combined into one chart. And so this, they still provide two. One is the moderate, one is the conservative. The conservatives on the next page. But while I'm on the moderate page, let me show you some trends quickly. So if you go to the 12th grade class and then look at the first, uh, the second column on the right-hand side, that's 2023, go to 12th grade, you'll see there that the class is 975 students. Now look at the following year. 
it drops to 858 students, right? Why is that? Because that 975 students have graduated, right? Go to 11th grade for 2023, you'll see there's 850 students. Those are the 850 students that in 2024 will be moving to 12th grade. So no longer is that cohort 975, now it's a smaller cohort of 858. So when you look at that, even if you just look at 12th grade across, you'll see it, you know, progressing down and then it goes up, you know, based again, it's taking into account all the housing developments and that kind of stuff. So there's a couple of different things happening at one time. Our 12th grade classes have been pretty huge because we've had an increase in enrollment for a good few years. But as you look at the progress going through, some of those classes are declining in size or grades are declining in size because you have declining enrollment. Then when the you know new students come in from those housing units, that's when you see that increase again by grade by grade. So when our demographers compiling all these numbers, they take into account all those trends. But essentially, if there was no housing, no new housing, then we are definitely going through declining enrollment. Because when you look at, if you go all the way up to 2023 and go to kindergarten, 614 students. So you have 614 students in kindergarten, but 975 students in the 12th grade that are graduating. So the new students coming in is much smaller. Like here you can see 300 students smaller than the students graduating on the 12th grade and moving out of the system. So that shows you part of the declining enrollment, you know, lesser number of kids being born in the city, all that kind of stuff, people moving out of the city as well. So this as a whole shows what we're looking like for the next couple of years. Of course, we update this every year. And in the moderate projections for next year, they're looking at a decline of 1.2%. And then an increase of 1.8% in 2025. So that's what we're showing on moderate. If you go to the next page, you'll see our conservative projections. And again, it's the same kind of trends as we've seen on the prior page, except the numbers of the percentages at the bottom are a little bit different. So the percentage change for 2024 is a decrease here of 2.5%. And then when you go to 25, it's looking at going up now by a half a percent. So somewhat different from the moderate projections. Again, when we're dealing with facilities, we always want to make sure that we don't know exactly how many kids are going to come. But if they do, we need to make sure we have the capacity to be able to do that. And so when we're dealing with facilities, we bring through the moderate, but always want to show the conservative as well. Because as we're talking about finance and that kind of stuff, those are the projections that we utilize. So you've seen the moderate before, and these are the conservative projections that we're looking at utilizing for next fiscal year. And this here is just a slide of all of the housing that's coming into the district, uh, um, into the district uh, right now. Uh, we check with the city to make sure this is current. Uh, everything is pretty much on track. The only difference in this one particular slide is that we projected that we would have had some of the houses, some of the uh, apartments ready in the Atkinson's project last year. And so we only carry 60 24, but actually that should be 202 that's carrying now. They did start the people moving in the first of this month. So so that means that there are some kids, we haven't got the list yet, but there should be some kids, not sure they're new kids or old kids, but there be, should be kids moving to that facility. And we should have a number from there pretty soon what's in there. But this is a list of the projects that we have moving forward. Uh, I met with uh, the city last Wednesday, just to make sure that everything is still happening. We had a concern in one of the, the sites, the Stoneman Park uh, project, and it wasn't on the list at the time when we was doing the review of the city uh, master plan. And what they told me was that the uh, developer is hit some hiccups and they're trying to work through the hiccups. And so it wasn't on the city master plan right then, but it will be put back very shortly. So all the projects that we see there, which is basically the Stoneman uh, Park, 
which is the old golf course area. It will have that many houses being built and that uh, we didn't ask for a new chart, but it's being pushed out at least maybe another year. Other than that, the uh, numbers are, are right on point. Next steps. April 29th, the facilities workshop again, and we plan to look at the impacts of growth for the new development, uh, discuss the uh, properties options, review current and new capacity per site, uh, remind you the June board items that's coming forth in June regarding the bond, and then the list of projects that we made a look at for going forward. Is this the agenda for 29th of April? Yes. So I have a question. Thank you very much for this presentation. So um, with the 29th uh, facilities workshop, th this is all great information. Um, but I wanted to ask for the 29th, I know that we're doing workshops. So we're sort of getting information. But uh, do some of these items or some of these items going to require decisions from the board? I know that we have a decision for placing a bond or not on the ballot. But I'm talking about these these here. Do they have decisions that we're going to have to make aside from the bond issue? No, the bond um, would be the first decision the board makes. Okay. And then pending that decision or around the same time, it's up to the board. You would look at the list of projects and reprioritize. And Got you it. may move another project up, another project depending. So that's something that commonly happens, but it doesn't have to be um, before got it the decision for the bond and then if there is any kind of decision and you, you'll have much more information april right because we right. project out about five years but we're going to look out a little bit further if there's any decision around um a, the need for an additional building that would be something but that would all come after the the decision for the bond and that would require the bond to pass so that would be part of the 24 25 school year one thing that we've done throughout the years is when we have done um, portable replacement projects or the school replacement project, we thought ahead and we added a few classrooms to those projects where we could without having to go through a whole other level of approval. Because we knew, like many cities, that there was growth happening. And so when we did Parkside, for example, we added on classrooms in addition to what the former Parkside building had. When we did the portable replacement at Los Modanos, we added on a couple more classrooms than what the former um, portables held. Hillview, the plans for Hillview has plans for five additional classrooms. So we've put them in, in order to be able to think whether it's our configuration or 10 years from now that there would be some flexibility in spaces. So we have done that throughout and we'll look at a closer look at that in April too, to look at the capacities of our buildings. Question. Well, we had a problem at the high school where we had to build uh, Wayne P. What happened that we, had, where that influx of students come from so fast? That's what I'm trying to figure out. That we had to build how many classrooms? Twelve. Well, we... Eighteen. No, thirty. Thirty. Sorry, that was in twenty eighteen. Thirty classrooms. So placed, right? No. no, those were additional classrooms. So, so uh, um, some of that history predates me. But when I did come here, there were thirty teachers at Pittsburgh High School who were floating. They were sharing classrooms. You may remember some of that. Some of that from there too. There were also portables already on the building and so and no other place to really put additional portables. And there wasn't a plan for growth. And so we did pass a bond um, in the fall of 2014. And then the board reprioritized the projects to put the additional classrooms at Pittsburgh High School top of the list. And then we went through a process where we had students involved, the community involved. We looked at various spaces, um, pros and cons of each, did surveys, everyone weighed in, and then ultimately went with what it now is the P building for that in order to 
get that project done and relieve the pressure that was there. And so that enrollment has come down a little bit, but not significantly. So, you know, I don't know. It. So, so it didn't seem like it was necessarily a, um, a giant influx at one time, but that was building up over time that hadn't been thought of maybe in the long term in order to get in front of that need. The enrollment has come down a little because we have moved independent study. That was one of the projects. So we moved that. Um, and then also there has been some enrollment decline because um, districts are tighter as are we with inter-district transfers in terms of being able to leave your home district to go to another district. And we had quite a few. Um, we still do, but not at the rate we do that we did. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just want to say that I appreciate the facility staff for really um, working on putting this presentation together, but not just that, also on working to have a good plan with our facilities, along with thanking the uh, Bond Oversight Committee as well, because I think there's a lot of work, a lot of good work that is going in to make sure that not only our facilities are built well, but also that we get all the dollars that we are entitled to after those buildings are built. And um, I think these graphs on just the latest amounts that we've been receiving, sometimes on projects that predate um, the, a lot of the staff here now, I think is extremely, is a good demonstration of really trying to do all we can. So I just want to thank all of you um, for that and uh, the whole staff. And of course, I, I know some of the bond oversight uh, committee members are here today. want to thank them as well too, uh, for all the work that they do to do this. And, and it's just really great to be able to see all this information. And I'm really looking forward to the information in April um, so we can take a look uh, in more detail. So thank you. We did bring you some pictures here. You can look at what was that like to have my boards up so you can see and as <laughs> evidence that there is some hard work going on and we know what's going on in our community. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the board has time, but off the top of your heads now, are there any particular pieces of information that you want to make sure that we bring back in April? Again, you can make these requests at any time, but if there's something now in your minds that you want to make sure that we bring back when we have the April workshop. So I don't think this is new information, but I just like as we're ordering, how much of this is would be of the order would be based on existing funding and how much of the ordering will be based on new funding? I don't know if I asked my question correctly. Ordering of what? So like we're supposed to be ordering the projects. Oh, the priority. No. Yeah, but I'm saying but based on how much of that that ordering would be used by existing funding that a bond funding that might exist in the district or versus or going out for a new bond would need to cover the order. I don't think there is any more funding. Yeah, there's no more money. So everything has to be covered by a new bond, correct? Okay. Yes. Correct. The Hillview Junior High School project is we're expected to use our whole bond. Plus there is a cushion of Mr. Scott has because there's always unintended weather, for example, delays that can happen. So there's 6 million that we have set aside for that. So there's a remote possibility that there might be a million or two left from that. But in essence, our entire bond is um, will be used with Hillview. That'll be the remaining bond funds. Well, Hillview get new furniture. Uh, will they take the 1930s furniture over with the, to the new school? Like I said before, the state on their side do, doesn't pay for any furniture. But what we do cover is the five extra classrooms we do put funding in. For those new classrooms, we do do that. But for I am pricing, just to see what the number looks like, what that cost would be. I haven't brought it forth yet, but I'm expecting it's somewhere around a million dollars extra we have to spend to do furniture. But remember, the other sites did not get all new furniture either. Well, some of them did. It, yeah, it's usually a mix. We always do the best that we can, and you'll have an opportunity to to weigh in. Well, I I, like I new schools, new furniture. <laughs> I like me. Sometimes some people like things to be vintage, Mister Miller. 
No, but um, so I, I, I already mentioned the uh, details regarding the surveys um, I would like to see at the next meeting. But what one of the things that I'm unclear about is when you say discuss PUSD properties options, I know we had the, the evaluation of the properties um, and pretty much across the board, they suggest residential um, um, development is probably the best use for them. When you say discuss PUSD property options, is are we talking about discussing what to do with those properties? Is that the intent of that discussion? I think for the purposes of this, it would be to discuss where, if any of our properties, we would have the ability to place a new additional building of Got some it. sort. That will be the only thing that we'll be discussing at the okay. April workshop is which of our current properties that we own are either big enough or would or have the correct space how what could we put on that versus discussing um their worth or sale that so it would really it so that is really just to say oh if we do need additional building here's what we own so that wouldn't cost us for the property piece and here's the size that it could have on there right well well the district office be part of that when we discuss it if we decide to say sell this, take the money, we could go to a, another property and bill. Will that be part of the discussion? No? I don't think that would be part of the April 29th discussion. It certainly could be part of a other discussion, but again, we haven't listed any of our properties for sale or put together any of that. We're really focused on the needs of the schools and what we would do in terms of um, any bonding capacity to meet the needs of our school facilities. And I, I was just going to say, Dr. Schur, so then that's going to coincide with the next one there, which is reviewing current and new capacities per site, which will let us know where we would need an additional building if we do. Correct. So we'll look at, um, Mr. Scott has some of the school attendant zones out here as well, too, right. for example. We'll look at the overall capacity. We'll say, well, across our elementary schools, we actually could do this, for example. You know, we have, I haven't looked at it through. We would have enough, but maybe we have to change an attendance pattern. Maybe we have to because we may have more room in one school than another, depending on the housing. So that's the type of thing that we'll look right. at is is what would be a potential new building if we did need a new building. So how else can we mitigate that? Because um, one thing that's important, you know, to remember is that our bonding capacity is set by the values of the homes in the community. And so one of, you know, just a, a little bit of soapbox privilege here on this too. So um, a similar size district, for example, Pleasanton is about maybe 3,000 students more than we have. Pleasanton passed a bond for $395 million because they were able to because of the home values there. Our bonding capacity has usually been about 100. I think now it's about 140 million if we maxed out what we could pass a bond for. Now, school doesn't cost any different here than it does there, but it gives you an example of, um, first of all, the long history of how well the district has done with the bonds and our facilities, but also the importance of really being thoughtful and strategic about the best uses of the any kind of bonding capacity. So to the point of we would always look at, can we rearrange attendance zones? Can we do different things to accommodate any growth that would not require additional bonds than what we could even qualify for? Okay, because yeah, because I remember at least a couple of times I remember us talking about reviewing attendance zones. I know once we've done it when I've been on the board, but there's really been no, like, I know when we was at the SS Student Support Services Center, we had talked about potentially looking at board policy around when we would review those attendance zones and not sure when we'll ever get around to that. But then also, like, for years, we've talked about Pittsburgh High School and, and, that growth there and what's the plan i know that originally staff brought a plan about modernizing or tearing down uh north campus um but i'm just want as we think about a lot of these things maybe have an opportunity for us to discuss it because i think that they're real they're real 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 crises in a way that 
Pittsburgh high school is growing to a capacity where we might have to go back to having teachers share spaces because we're having too many kids in our buildings or we have, or other alternatives. And so I just want to just make sure, and I know for years we've talked about um, our middle school overage and, and I, and I'm thankful that we were able to add the extra five classrooms, but just under, but understanding where we are in a sense that when the new school MLK was built, it was hoping that we wouldn't have to keep relying on Hillview and, and uh, Rancho to be the extensions of that. But it just seems like even with the modernization, we're going back to rely on Hillview to hold that extension. Um, so I'm just wondering if those things we can kind of look at. A absolutely. All those things are important to look at and look at long-term. And the thing that's very complicated is I'm sure that people made the decision that was the best decision with the best information they had at the time. But for MLK to have been built to have a capacity that's 300 students less or 400 students less than the other two junior highs didn't result in three junior highs of the same size because the enrollment trends just don't support that. Although all of our students are in classrooms, we have space, you know, um, with that as well too. For Pittsburgh High School, we did have the discussion um, on the building that was part of the whole community discussion and vote around what ended up being now the P building. But one of the possibilities was the um, former North or the old North Campus that we call it. And that would be something if there's going to be um, additional space needed for Pittsburgh High School, that could always be an option as well, as well, too. All of those things. Um, would require any any additional building would require a bond though yeah so it's like talking about that and also priorities for that matter is like putting the cart before the horse we need to pass a bond first if we pass a bond if that's what we elect to do then all of this would be very important because we would have to decide what's going to be built first Correct. And we would want to take the time to really get a lot of community input around right. where would be the best place, what would be the best type of program or the best type of school so that we could really um, use that as an opportunity to do something that would meet the needs best of the community with their input. Absolutely. Anyone else have any comments or anything else they wanted to discuss? Well, I wanted to say thank you very much for the presentation. Um, yes, Mr. Haria. Sorry, just one other thing. There was a question with regards to affordable housing. We did discuss it in the facility subcommittee, but just for the, the the entire board, if you'd like, Mr. Scott, just to be able to go through that quickly, the affordable housing with the jobs, the workforce housing. Oh, yes. We, we did bring the drawings that we talked about a couple of years ago with um, uh, housing for the teachers about the drawings and stuff, but in that discussion and in the facility subcommittee, we explained to to members that uh, the reason why we did not move forward is because of the need to have the district as a landlord and our focus is on kids. So what comes first, though, taking care of your kids? Are you having your maintenance department go and take care of a plumbing leak? Uh, at the facility, those kind of things. Uh, but we, the district did spend uh, a lot of time and effort investigating that process and what was the best need and use for that facility. And at that time, we decided not to move forward with that project. And the main reason we didn't move forward with that project was because it was built for the district to have bond money to fund that project. And as you can see, our bond money is already use for all of our school sites and we wouldn't have had enough money to do Hillview and also do uh, workforce housing. Now that doesn't mean that we can't ever do that. It means that we wouldn't do it with a bond and I wouldn't recommend us doing it with a bond because our capacity isn't high enough with that. But we could also explore in the future partnering with the developer. And so those kinds of partnerships Maybe the city would have an interest. Maybe a developer would have an interest. But there's multiple, you know, different ways that we could explore that we have not explored with that property. But why we didn't do it at the time was it was built on um, that we would have funded it ourselves through a bond project, which 
we just felt wasn't a good use of those funds given the needs of our school sites. And then also the school district being a landlord is a whole other level of, of work and expertise that would require an entire different department, as Mr. Scott said. But there are other ways to explore it. For example, if a developer wanted to partner and, and again, looking at whatever kind of um, partnership or deal that we would work so that X percentage of the places could be for our employees at a certain rate or things like that, that would be something that we would have to explore. Okay, so if there are no other comments, I believe that that's the extent of our agenda. Do we have any public comments at all? Okay, so then with that, um, I will adjourn this workshop and we have our regularly scheduled board meeting this Wednesday, uh, February 28th. See everyone then. Thank you very much again.